We come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Risen Lord Jesus, on this Easter morning we come to worship and adore you. We join with all your people in heaven and on earth to greet you and celebrate the victory you have won over death. For our sake, you became a vulnerable human being and lived an earthly life, experiencing all the human emotions of joy and sadness, love and rejection, hope and disappointment. You brought hope as our healing Lord, giving sight to the blind, steps to the lame, offering comfort to the sorrowful, strength to the weak, and spoke words of hope to those who had lost their way. You became our dying Lord, suffering under human hands, you were beaten and tortured, and went silently and willingly to the cross. You even asked the Father's forgiveness for those who hung you there. You are our Saviour, and on this Easter morning we come to worship and adore you. So, risen Lord, on this Easter day, we celebrate the joyful news that you, Christ, are alive. We celebrate the amazing love of God the Father, shown in the giving of himself in his only Son for all humanity. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we celebrate that death has been overcome and new life is a gift to all who believe. On this Easter morning, we come to worship and adore you. We come before you now as forgiven, loved and freed people by your incredible sacrifice for us. Help us to live as Easter people, celebrating life, challenging wrongs, and through our lives, show we truly are your disciples, and by our witness, bring others to know you too. Living, loving, risen Lord, on this Easter morning, we come to worship and adore you. Amen. Amen. Please would you turn to page 162 in the service book. We proclaim together, glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Can you believe that Lent is over? 40 days, six weeks of reflection, of penitence, of walking the way of the cross. And during that time, every Sunday, we have brought to the cross various symbols of Christ's passion, the bread and the wine, the bowl and the towel, the 30 pieces of silver of betrayal, the whip, the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and those who came here on Good Friday, we bought the nails, and the Reverend Martin hammered the nails and reminded us 
of what the cross was all about when Jesus stretched out his arms upon it to show us his love for us. And today, we transform the cross from that place of sacrifice into new life, resurrection hope. Some of you, when you came in, because you knew what to do, were given a flower and you came and put it in the cross. Well, I'm new as well. I don't know about this in this church. So in our next hymn, we have an opportunity, if we've got a flower, to come and put it in the cross. And if you didn't pick a flower up, then they're at the back of church for you to go and get one and come and transform our cross from the dull brown wood of our Christmas trees, because that's what they were, into this life-giving, life-enhancing and really beautiful cross. So we sing together the head that once was crowned with thorns. If you have a flower or you need to go and get one, please do so and bring it in this hymn. We stand to sing. We want to proclaim that Jesus is alive. We want to proclaim that in the way that we live our lives. We want to pray that, proclaim that with the priorities in the way we use our time and our money. And that's why we bring you these gifts that through the work of this church, we might proclaim that there is a God who loves, that there is a Jesus who's walked in our shoes, that there is a Holy Spirit who seeks to come to our hearts. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we proclaim your love to us. Accept these gifts, we pray, and use them to your glory. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our reading is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 42, to chapter 16, verse 8. You can follow through in your order of service hymn sheet. The Burial of Jesus. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took the body down, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, They saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray, that as we hear the story of that first Easter morning, the risen Christ might be real in our hearts and lives. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. 
one of the very best selling series of books, publishers if you like, are those published by Mills and Boone. I won't ask you to put your hand up if you read Mills and Boone books because I'm sure that you'd all be looking at each other and not wanting to admit it. You might not know they publish over a hundred books a month and across the world they sell 200 million books a year. Here in the United Kingdom one book is sold every six and a half seconds and that's three million a year and most of the readers are women. What I didn't know until I did a bit of research into it is that the books are on the book stand for just a month. Then they're taken off the book stand, you can buy them from the publisher for three months and then they're pulped. Which is why there's such a huge demand for second-hand Mills and Boone books. Although I'm wondering quite how the Kindle revolution will affect um, all this sort of pattern of selling. Now what is it that makes them so popular? Why are they so popular? Well, they're romantic. And then they're to a set formula, so people know what's going to happen. They're familiar with the style. And then most important of all, there is always a happy ending. Now in 40 years of preaching, Looking over my records, I've never preached on the resurrection story as it's recorded in Mark's Gospel. And I wonder if that's because the happy ending, the great resurrection story, is set out less clearly in Mark's Gospel. Now you might say to me, well that's not correct. Here in uh, chapter 18 and verses 9 to 14, if you've got a Bible there, there's an account of Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene and then to the eleven. Now that's true, it is here. But when you look at what it says here, it says the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. Almost all scholars agree that this is a later edition. Now that doesn't mean it's not true. The other Gospels show us a record of Jesus appearing to both Mary and to the eleven. But the earliest versions of Mark's Gospel end here in verse 8. And it seems that just as I and many of you like a Mills and Boone happy ending, so this ending was not thought to be strong enough Therefore, it was added to at a later date with material taken from Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. Now, the theologian and Bible commentator, Professor Tom Wright, is quite clear that these are added endings, but he says, and argues in his books, that he's quite sure that Mark would not have ended here. That there was another ending that's perhaps been lost. I don't know if you realize that uh, in those days everything was written on a scroll, and it was quite easy for the end of the scroll, the last thing in the scroll, to get broken off. Well, that might be so, but until it's discovered, this is, of course, mere speculation. But why is it not strong enough to stand on its own? I think, now I've spent some time studying it, that it is. If we look at the record, verses 42 to 47, make it quite clear that Jesus was in fact dead. That his body was properly prepared by these women, these women who loved him in life and loved him still in death. And that they saw where the body was laid. Then, on a third day when the Sabbath was over, the key facts are quite clear. Here in chapter 16, verse 1 onwards, we see them going to do some further anointing to the body of Jesus. And as they go, they wonder how they could, as dare I say it, weaker women, uh, how they were going to be able to roll the stone away in order to get access to the tomb. But be quite clear here, as they went, they did not think that they were going to witness the resurrection. 
But when they get there, the stone has been rolled away. The body of Jesus has vanished. But a young man, presumably some sort of an angelic messenger, is there to speak to them. And I always find this encounter somewhat amusing. Verse 6, the messenger says, don't be alarmed. Well, do you know, I think I might have been just a little bit alarmed if I'd gone to uh, a place where I expected to find a stone, great rock in place, but it was rolled away. If I'd expected to find a tomb closed, but it was open. If I'd expected to find the body of a dead friend there, but it had vanished. If I'd expected nothing unusual there, but instead there's an angel of some sort sitting there. No wonder, no wonder the messenger needed to say to them, don't be alarmed. But the messenger then goes on, <coughs> verses 6 and 7. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He's risen, he's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Jerusalem. There you will see him, just as he told you. Four things to notice about uh, what's said here. He is risen. Jesus had always said that he would rise from the dead. That's what he's done. He is risen. And then secondly, he's not here. See the place where they laid him. We assume that they could see as they looked around the tomb. This was a visual confirmation from them of the physical fact that the body had gone. It had disappeared. Goes on, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. I think this must have been a great relief to these women that they didn't have to keep all this as a secret. Nor did they have to bear the sole responsibility for sharing the story of the resurrection. Jesus would appear to others. They would, as it said here, see him. The good news of the resurrection was not just for a select few. It was for all people, a truth for many. And yet they're still in such a state that we read in verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is what I like about the Bible. It's so real. It's not some manufactured story. It's so honest, so real. Wouldn't you have been trembling if you thought you were coming to see the dead body of a loved one and instead you've just seen an angelic messenger? <laughs> Wouldn't you have been bewildered and wondering what on earth was going on? Wouldn't you have got away from this strange scene and this strange guy as fast as your legs could take you in case something happened to you? You might vanish as well. Wouldn't you keep quiet about it? Keep quiet because people might think you were around the bend. Wouldn't you have been terrified? Terrified that perhaps you were going mad? Terrified that this strange angelic being might attack you. Terrified as to what had happened to your loved one. Terrified as to what the future might hold. This is so real, so natural, so understandable. And I think we learn three things from it that might be of help to us on this Easter day. First, there is no doubt here in this account, even though you haven't got the resurrection appearances afterwards, there is no doubt that Jesus has risen from the dead. And if Jesus has risen from the dead, it means, my sisters and brothers, that life and history can never be the same. God has come amongst us. God has shown his love for us. God has taken the powers of darkness and sin and death, those powers that seemed at first to have had the victory over Jesus. God's taken them and defeated them, and the life and the love and the words of Jesus Christ have been vindicated. And this means that for you and for me, death is not a dark end, but a new beginning. 
a new beginning of light and life and hope. This means that whatever kind of mire and depth of sin we've sunk into, however we've messed up our lives, however many mistakes we've made, however many wrong choices we've made, that there is forgiveness. There is a new beginning that's been opened up by Jesus Christ and his cross and resurrection. This means that if we are without peace, peace can be ours. If we are without direction, the way forward can become clear. If we are without a sense of self-worth, we can discover a new identity and a new value in Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And the resurrection of Jesus can change even you. And then, secondly, I think this reaction of the women gets us away from the familiarity of the story. Somehow, Easter in the Northern Hemisphere has been wrapped up with a lovely, cuddly view of nature. Our Maltesers appear as a red bunny rabbit. Our lint chocolate appears as a golden bunny rabbit. Our Cadbury's chocolates as a green cream egg. And in fact, when we came up into the pulpit here, I thought it was Sister Denise. It's the sort of thing she does. But um, we, we discovered we got four little, uh, um, what are they? They're chickens, aren't they? <laughs> Chicks. We've got four little chicks here, and one is in West Ham colours, which I greatly appreciate. But actually, I thank you, whoever it was, I don't know who those gave us those, but they're a wonderful sermon illustration, the point I'm trying to make, actually. Uh, not that I'm ungrateful, I'm just saying that we tied Easter into spring and into bunny rabbits and chicks and new life. Well, the icy weather of the last few days has reminded us that spring does not always come when we want it to, nor as we would like it to. And this resurrection story is not, in fact, a cosy and warm story. It is a disturbing story because it's a story about something very unnatural happening. People just do not rise from the dead. When you're dead... You're dead. And we can become so familiar with this Easter story that across the years we too easily forget that this is an amazing story. It's an amazing story in every sense of the word amazing. It's an amazing story about an amazing event. And so I pray that you might be just a little bit disturbed this Easter morning. And that the resurrection might in some way therefore impact your life rather than just become part of a familiar ritual. And then third, this ending here in Mark's Gospel reminds us that we complete the Easter story. There is a real sense in which it can be said that those who were the very first witnesses to the resurrection of Christ, these three women, made a response which is weak and a failure. They say nothing, they're afraid, they run away. But also, in a very real sense, we're reminded here that as Christians trying to follow Christ, we often say nothing. We're often a failure. We often run away from the reality of our lives and the reality of the things that God's calling us to do. We do not live out our faith in our everyday experience. This account is so real. There's no Mills and Boone ending to it. And sadly, there's usually no Mills and Boone's ending in our Christian experience either. There will be times when we mess up. There will be times when we lack faith. There will be times when we are less than the woman or the man God wants us to be, God intends us to be. 
There will be times when we see the empty tomb, but we're not too sure whether or not we believe. There will be times when we long to see an angelic messenger because that might just prove it all to us. But let me remind you that this resurrection is not the whole gospel package. The whole gospel package is about the incarnation, about Christmas, about God coming to dwell with us. The whole gospel passage is about the wonderful teaching of Jesus Christ. Teaching which if people followed it would change the world. The whole package is about the suffering of Jesus Christ. Entering into our broken humanity. Knowing what it is to be forsaken by family and friends. Knowing what it is even to carry sin in his life. As on the cross he felt abandoned by God. And of course, the death of Jesus. Entering into that final place that haunts us and worries us and concerns us. That's the whole. Not just this resurrection. There's a wholeness to it. You and I will not always be full of faith and life. We will not always be as sure as the disciples were when they finally saw the risen Jesus. There will be times when our humanity is so broken that we can only marvel that Jesus came to step in our shoes. There will be times when all we can do is hang in and do our best to follow his teaching because we believe that even though we're not quite sure who he is, that his teaching would transform this world if only people followed it. There will be times when we are suffering physically or mentally or spiritually or socially and all that takes us through is the fact that we know he has walked there before us that's the reality of life and there will be times when the death of a loved one seems to break us or the prospect of our own death threatens to engulf us we only have the comfort then that he wept at the grave of a friend and that he too has entered that cold darkness of death that's the reality but there will also be times when we actually live in this reality of Easter day of this resurrection day When we know deep in our hearts that all will be well and all manner of things will be well. When we realize that this victory over death opens up an eternity before us. That this life is not the whole business. That there's another life beyond. And that the God who holds us now will take us through into the next life. There will be times, sometimes creeping up on us unawares, and often not when we're in church, when we have that deep experience of the risen Christ holding us, helping us, keeping us, filling us. And my prayer is, that that might be your experience this Easter morning. That in bread and in wine you may encounter the living Jesus Christ. And because of that, on this Easter Sunday, as we celebrate that Jesus is alive, that this world may indeed be a different place for you. Thanks be to God for his word to us. Amen. Be seated. In our prayers for ourselves and others, there is a response. When I say, Lord of life, will you please say, in your mercy, hear us. Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. Let us pray. On this day of resurrection that the Lord has made, we come 
And we are reminded that death is a new beginning because of Christ. The resurrection changes everything. And let us open our hearts as we reflect on Martin's words to allow the resurrection to impact our lives. May we not be those who are quiet and fearful. Even if we came to church feeling that way this morning, may we, as we take bread and wine together, be transformed and live in the reality of the victory of Easter Day. So we ask that we may be transformed and that we may be agents of transformation in this world. Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. And let us pray for the world that Jesus gave his life for and is wanting to transform. And we pray especially for places where suffering has not yet been turned to joy but where there is violence and warfare and death. We remember, especially at the moment, that North Korea has said it's entering a state of war with South Korea in the latest escalation of rhetoric against their neighbor and the U.S. We pray for other parts of the world where people are not able to live in harmony with one another. Our hearts are very much focused at the moment on Syria, as violence spreads deeper into the country. We pray for all who've been so deeply affected by war, and we pray for healing and peace. Glorious Prince of Peace, give us vision of new communities of victorious love and help world leaders to be hopeful and bring people and communities together rather than tearing them apart. Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. And we pray for the church, and we give thanks for people who are joyful because of their faith today. For those who will take bread and wine for the first time. For new Christians in the world's churches, especially for Easter events and acts of witnesses. And for all who will simply be encouraged today by being with their sisters and brothers in Christ. And we ask you to strengthen the mission and witness of your church here at Methodist Central Hall, especially during our year of centenary celebrations. That we may continue to work together with Easter faith in our hearts with the other churches here in Westminster to work for your kingdom in this neighborhood and in this nation. We continue to pray for the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and the new Pope Francis. May they, together with other Christian leaders, have the courage to speak out, and especially over matters concerning poverty and issues relating to justice and integrity and peace. May Easter faith ooze from them. And we pray for the leadership of the Methodist Church in Britain, especially for our president of conference, Mark, for our vice president, Mike, and our general secretary, Martin. Give them wisdom, we pray. In our prayer handbook today, it's the last day of the month, and we pray especially with Christians in Britain and Ireland, praying especially for the work and influence of women and the National Committee of the Women's World Day of Prayer. We pray with the World Council of Churches and the World Methodist Council. And today, particularly, we focus on mission partners, those who have given their life for mission around the world, but have returned recently from overseas. We pray, too, for those in training and transit, we pray that you'll give our mission partners people to help them readjust 
and to drink deeply from the wells of experience of having lived in another culture, that they may share their faith and all they've experienced, that others may learn and be revived. Grant them help and give us all hope. Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. And we also remember the families of the more than 80 miners buried in a landslide in Friday in Tibet. May all in need and those who grieve be granted strength and healing and comfort. And may any sorrow be turned to in time to dancing through the power of Jesus who conquers sin and conquers death. May all who suffer have confidence in the great promises of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And we end our prayers on a note of rejoicing for the physical new life of the news that for those two children we rejoice in this morning. And may they be for us symbols of the life that God has given us. And may we and they live our lives to the full. In the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We turn in our service book to page 168, and we're going to share the peace with one another on page 168. Will you please stand? The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. And they were glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the risen Christ be always with you. And also with you. Alleluia. Alleluia. Let us turn to the person on our left and our right and share the peace of the Lord. Remain standing. Turn to page 169. Is there anybody who can't see a book? Please put a hand up. We'll see. Good. Lord, accept these gifts, we pray, and may they be blessed for this Syrian appeal. And we pray your blessing also on this chalice which we use on this first Easter Sunday for the first time. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. We're on page 169, page 169. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessing and honor, glory and power are rightly yours, O gracious God. By your creative word you brought the world to birth. In your generous love you made the human family that we might see your glory and live forever in your presence. Blessing and honor, glory and power are rightly yours, O gracious God. When we wandered from you in our sin, you sought us with your steadfast love and did not give us up. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son to be our Saviour and Deliverer. Made of flesh and blood, he lived our life and died our death upon the cross. Death could not hold him. 
And now he reigns at your right hand. Blessing and honor, glory and power are rightly yours, O gracious God. Therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we bless and praise your glorious name, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed indeed is the Lord Jesus Christ, who at supper with his friends took bread and gave you thanks. Broke it, gave it to them and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup and gave you thanks. Gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Dying, you destroyed our life. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Therefore, Father, we celebrate this Passover of gladness. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Except through him, our great high priest, <coughs> this our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Gather us who share this feast into the kingdom of your glory, that with all your people in every time and place we may praise and worship you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom and with whom. <coughs> All honor and glory are yours, Heavenly Father, now and always. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. The 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 body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for me. Blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for me. Go to that side with Ollie. Okay. If you go with me, and you go with Daddy. With body of Christ broken for you. 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 Body of Christ, broken for you. Body of Christ, broken for you. (coughs) 
We meet the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread, draw near with faith. Have we got the stewards with trays? Who's doing the trays, do you know? Do on that side, Kim. Body of Christ broken for you. Put it in the rack. In the rack. Body of Christ broken for you. We turn to page 172, page 172, and we will say together the second prayer, prayer B. Lord our God, we give thanks because you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that, as by his resurrection, we are brought to new life, so by his continued reign in us, we may be brought to eternal joy through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. So we stand to sing together that great resurrection hymn, Thine be the glory. Oh, 
Now may the love of the living Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in your discipleship. And may the peace and the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and lives day by day. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this Easter time and in the year to come. Amen. Amen. Stewards, can I just say that as folk come in, there's seats over this side, 
we're very full up on this side, so push people over to the other side. Thank you. Nicely. <laughs> Nicely, yes. Nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Politely, gently. Nicely. <laughs>